So, thank you very much for the invitation, Olga. Just leaving to get my thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to talk to you about this subject today. Um, the reason that I'm talking to you about this subject is because humans are in a bit of a pickle. Okay, we've got a bit of a problem. There are quite a few problems that we've heard about which are global, not national, not local, but global. One of which is climate warming, climate change. Another one I'm going to try and convince you today is antibiotic resistance. So this is the resistance of bacteria which cause infections to the drugs we use to kill them. And it's not a very happy story, um, so you may feel glum at the end. But if you do, then I can assume that you've got some understanding of the, the kind of the level of challenge that we have as a human race to try and solve this. So the objectives of the talk, I'm going to go into the causes of antibiotic resistance. I'm going to try and teach you a little bit more um, than you already know, and I believe that you've You've kind of covered this recently, which is excellent. I'm going to go into the factors that contribute to the spread of resistance, because this is important as well. It's not just the emergence of resistance in a particular strain, it's the spread between strains and also between humans. And then I'm going to touch on what we can do about it as individuals, as societies, um, and then introduce you to a small project that I've got looking for new antibiotics, which hopefully you guys will take part. So, context of the problem, as I've said. One of the greatest threats to mankind's well-being is the growing resistance to antibiotics of bacteria. And it's been identified by the World Health Organization as a priority area for research. It was identified years ago as a priority area for research, but only recently have people in government and in power started to listen. Some quotes for you. So, when Alexander Fleming accepted his Nobel Prize in 1945, he already knew of the dangers of resistance. He discovered penicillin, and he stated that it's very easy, actually, to make bacteria resistant to penicillin if you treat them or you expose them to sub-inhibitory levels. So these are levels not enough to kill them, but it will select for a mutation to resistance. Uh, Chief Scientific Officer, who I've met a couple of times, very nice lady, Dame Sally Davis, she says and equates that the, the danger posed by resistance is equal to that of terrorism which is, if you imagine somebody is informing the government to think that, that's quite a serious affair. And David Cameron got on the bandwagon and also said it's quite important. Um, and then there's been a recent study carried out by an economist, uh, and they've, they've concluded that actually we have a possibility to return to what we call a pre-antibiotic era. So this is a, a time in our lives where actually we won't have any antibiotics that we can use to treat common infections. We get a cut or a graze, it gets infected, take a bit of amoxicillin, we're fine. But in a few years' time, cuts like this, small injuries, may actually end up killing you because we have nothing left to fight the bacteria. So it's a sobering thought. In terms of deaths, there's a report in 2009 that stated that there's about 25,000 deaths directly related to only eight particular bacteria in the EU, and at a cost of 1.5 billion euros. Now, unfortunately, it's the money that makes people's ears prick up when they're in power. It's very expensive, all these deaths are. There are a similar number of deaths in the USA each year as well. And the true cost of AMR, as I'll call it, will be equal to about $100 trillion lost to the global economy by 2050 and millions and millions of premature deaths. So these are deaths that we could have prevented. Okay. But this, this need has now been recognised and there's a lot of money coming through. So in the budget a couple of days ago, the government recently uh, confirmed that it was going to put into the Fleming Fund, which is £195 million pounds, um, in order to try and tackle antibiotic resistance worldwide. Uh, details of this are on the Wellcome Trust website. This is just a cartoon from a recent report which shows around about the year 2050 how many extra deaths are likely to be as a direct result of antibiotic resistant bacteria. Okay, you've got quite a bleak angle there actually. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> in, um, in Asia and Africa we're getting up towards about 5 million extra deaths per year. So you can see it really is quite a serious problem. Why is it serious? Well, you see that? Yep. what we're in at the moment is the term of discovery void. Okay? So since the introduction of penicillin around about 1930, 
We've had a constant stream of new drugs coming to market. It was excellent. It was the golden era of antibiotic drug discovery. But since daptomycin was introduced, there's been no new drugs coming to market for, well, since 1987. That's many years. You can do the maths. Okay, this means that the bacteria... Ah, thank you. Cool. This means that the bacteria... Sorry, I was getting distracted by the teeth. Bacteria have had the opportunity to emerge their resistance to all of the existing antibiotics. And we've had nothing that we can throw at them to combat the newly emerging resistances. So basically we've had to rely on the existing drugs. The existing drugs that we've got, and this has increased the selection pressure and the emergence of resistance to them. Why is there a lack of pharmaceutical interest in the production of new drugs? There's one answer really, and it's money. So pharmaceutical companies, AstraZeneca, GlaxoSmithKline, they all have shareholders. And the shareholders expect a dividend on their financial investment. And if I was the head of a company and I said, I'm going to invest a billion dollars in finding a new antibiotic, which may or may not work, and if it does and it gets through phase three trials, we can then give it to humans to use, and then within six months resistance will occur, so no one will use it, I would go absolutely crazy. I'd say, no, you're not using my money for that. You can invest in something else. Invest in a drug which somebody who's chronically ill has to take for the rest of their lives to treat, for example, Parkinson's. Okay? So there's no business model for a pharmaceutical company to invest in the discovery of antibiotics, which is a major problem. So incentivisation um, is being looked at now, but it's really quite accepted that the model is broken. It's going to be academic labs like mine in conjunction with industrial partners who come up with new drugs. Recent actions that the world has taken. Well, David Cameron has called for global action, which is all very easy to do, but he has actually backed it up with the investment in this new fund and other funds. The UK Research Councils have ring-fenced a lot of money, so I'm talking millions and millions of pounds, specifically for antimicrobial resistance research. Barack Obama in the USA has doubled the annual budget to $1.2 billion, again specifically for research into this particular area. And the NIH and BARDA have also got, um, got funding initiatives to increase the research. And this increase in money does work. So it was only recently that actually the first new antibiotic in 30 years, Tizabactin, was discovered, and this was reported in Nature. And we'll come on to a little bit of this towards the end of, uh, of the talk, because it just shows that by looking at natural systems, you can find new molecules which we could potentially use as antibiotics. And also, I'm sure many of you have heard of the Longitude Prize. So this is 10 million pounds offered by Nesta um, on the greatest challenge of our time. Um, the subject of antibiotics won hands down. It almost doubled the nearest uh, competing subject area, which I can't remember what it was. And then just to highlight, there are also many different initiatives, both in the US, the UK, Europe as a whole, all trying to get us to use antibiotics sensibly, not to overuse them, and to increase funding and research into this subject area. So, I hope I've convinced you it's actually quite a big problem. There's a lot of effort going in to try and to solve it. Whether we can is a different matter. So let's talk a little bit about exactly what we're talking about. Okay? So antibiotics are chemotherapeutic agents that are capable of inhibiting, which is bacteriostatic, or killing bactericidal cells. Okay? There's two different ways. You can either stop them growing, and they fail to cause disease in humans or animals, or you can kill them outright. And there are two main groups of these agents, depending on their origin. You've got the natural products, which are produced by bacteria, or fungi, or plants. And you've got the synthetic drugs, which, if they're fully synthetic, are produced, or used to be produced, at the laboratories of the pharmaceutical companies. But you can also have a semi-synthetic drug, which is where you've got a naturally produced molecule that you know has some activity against bacteria, but you can modify that molecule. You can use it as an engineering scaffold to kind of evolve a better one. Okay? There's different ways you can get to a suitable drug. It's not a new thing, though. 
Antibiotic resistance is ancient. So most of the antibiotics that we have at the moment are produced by bacteria. So if bacteria is producing an antibiotic, it must also have a resistance mechanism. Otherwise, it will kill itself, and this will never, ever evolve. There was a very, very nice study um, a few years ago which showed that from these 30,000-year-old pristine sediments, so these have never come into contact with humans or human influence, anthropogenic um, influence, lots of different well-known resistance genes to beta-lactams, tetracyclines, vancomycin could be isolated. Some of them were long operons, such as the vancomycin resistant one. So these genes were present in sediments far away from human activity 30,000 years ago. And now they're present in the hospitals. We've selected for them. So, when did we start to use antibiotics? Well, the first one came out, well, was discovered in 1928, and it shortly was followed by commercial production. But actually, humans have been quite ingenious in that we've used antibiotic uh, molecules before this. So, for example, the Greeks and Indians used moulds and plants to treat infections. Okay, this is well documented in ancient texts. In Greece and Serbia, mouldy bread was traditionally used to treat wounds and infections, most likely because they realised that the moulds produced antibiotics. So penicillin, for example, produced by penicillium notatum. We can grow that quite easily on any bread that you leave out on the worktop. In Russia, warm soil was routinely used by peasants to treat infected wounds. Imagine the diversity of the bacteria and the fungi in soil and how many different molecules they find. Some kind of experiments must have been done where somebody had a dirty wound and it was covered in soil and that didn't get infected, but one that was washed maybe, with fecally contaminated water did. So it's easy to see how these practices can um, kind of evolve in a society. And then we get to the more homeopathic Remedies such as doctors giving beer soup mixed with turtle shells and snake skins. The active ingredient in this is probably the alcohol in the, in the weak beer. And then there's documented cases of Babylonian doctors healing the eyes using a mixture of frog bile and sour milk. Sounds a bit strange, doesn't it? But sour milk means that the milk has gone sour and it contains probably a high uh, concentration of Lactococcus lactis bacteria and Lactococcus lactis produces quite a lot of known bactericins to kill other bacteria. Um, so there probably is a ring of truth to all of these. In addition, it's not molecules that are always produced by uh, bacteria. So silver is a great antimicrobial, and this has been used for thousands of years, or just over a thousand years, actually. I won't go through all these, but this one is noteworthy. But silver coins were dropped into liquids which were being transported, whether it be water or it be milk, because these would go off very, very fast, pre-refrigeration days. And with the addition of silver coins, it prevented the growth of spoilage organisms. So we've known about the antimicrobial compounds for a long time. So how do resistances to these compounds evolve? Well, it really is pure Darwinian survival of the fittest. It's one of the best examples of natural selection that we've got. And our level of use of any of these agents directly affects the prevalence of resistance. Okay? The more we select for it, the more it will be successful in the genetic background of these bacteria. Resistance involves the accumulation of inherently resistant bacteria. Okay? So if you treat somebody who has a bacterial infection and these bacteria are inherently resistant but you kill everything else, the population of your inherently resistant bacteria will expand because there's no competition. Resistance involves selection for mutation. Okay? So this is when the DNA undergoes a mutation during replication and it gives that particular bacteria an advantage and you select for that advantage during therapy. Then we've also got the spread of resistance genes and the spread of resistance strains amongst patients. So you can see it's a multifaceted um, problem that we've got to try and deal with. How quickly can it occur? Well, penicillin was introduced in 1941. Five years later, the proportion of penicillin-resistant bacteria had significantly increased. People were starting to get alarmed about how penicillin no longer seems to be working. And by 1960, penicillin-resistant Staph aureus was responsible for the majority of infections, of resistant infections, that occurred in hospitals. So even 55 years ago, we recognised the problem, but we didn't do anything about it because we had other antibiotics coming to the market every year. 
So we were complacent, we really were. And if you want to grow penicillin notatum, just leave an orange and don't, don't eat it. You'll grow it, it's very, very common. Which is why it infected the agar plates of Alexander Fleming when he left his window open in the lab. Something we wouldn't do now. We've got many of these different types of graphs. Okay, so this is resistance increasing over time for E. coli, which can cause many different diseases, including diarrhea. Um, in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland, to these four different drugs. Um, the scale goes to 2006. The trend increases to the current day. Resistance is increasing in pretty much, I would say, most bacteria causing infections. There are some that have stabilised, such as MRSA incidences. Um, the majority of Staph aureus, which is now resistant to methicillin, appears to have stabilised at 20%. But that's an unusual tale. They're usually increasing. So why? Are these pathogens doing well? Well, we've got more immunocompromised patients in the hospitals at the moment. We've got more of an aging population. So there are diseases of the, of the old, if you like, um, and the hospitals are full of them. And if the hospitals are full of old people who are immunocompromised, this represents a great source of food for the bugs. Because when you get ill, you are essentially just food. Um, we've got more indwelling devices and transplants in that cartoon on the left on your right, um, shows all the different bits of the body that we can implant or replace, and all of this gives bacteria the opportunity to cause infections within our body. And these are a lot more um, occurrences of these now compared to 20 or even 10 years ago. We also use antibiotics prophylactically, so if you're going to have an operation or you're going to have chemotherapy, you'll probably give an antibiotics as well, just to prevent infection. So this isn't to fight a particular infection, it's to prevent infection. And this has the, uh, the unwanted side effect of basically killing everything that's sensitive in your body. And this can clear out, for example, the contents of your gut and leave you vulnerable to Clostridium difficile infections. We've got Clostridium difficile there. Um, the infections with this bug and Enterococcus and some yeast such as Candida are all increasing in the hospital environment because we've created new niches for the, uh, the market. Some facts and figures for you. By 200 days of life, 70% of infants in the USA have been prescribed antibiotics. Has anybody here not knowingly ever taken antibiotics? Because you get a swab if you haven't. No, so everybody's 100%. Okay? Nobody's ever put their hand up when I ask that question, by the way. By the age of eight years, only 7% of children have not used an antibiotic in the UK. And this one here, this really, this really represents quite a problem. Okay, so this is for doctors and dentists um, in the land. 40% of paediatricians reported parental pressure for antibiotic prescription. This is because parents always know best. Okay, you've got a sick child, you want antibiotics. What about if it's a virus? Doesn't matter, you want antibiotics. <laughs> what do you say, what about this virus? Look, I'm a parent's child, I'll sue you if you don't give me antibiotics. Oh, are you going to sue me? Yeah. There you go, antibiotics. Okay, and we get, the, we get into a situation called the tragedy of the commons because there are so many inappropriate antibiotics given out that actually if one doctor decided to make a stand and not give antibiotics out, it's not going to make a blind bit of difference. Okay, because everybody else is doing it, so he might as well do it as well. Okay, so it's a kind of a self-feeding, disastrous situation. We, we just keep pumping antibiotics out into the society. In fact, it's so serious that last month, NICE, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, recommended that doctors, well, this is from the ITV, so NICE didn't use the word snoop, but doctors spy on colleagues. And if they notice that one particular colleague in their practice is prescribing a lot more antibiotics than usual, they should tell them. Okay? So it's that serious. They want doctors to turn against other doctors. Or you could look at it another way, be self-regulating. Okay, be responsible. So, what factors promote resistance? Well, obviously, we've got patient antibiotic use. Okay, so there's a massive pressure on patient use. We need them, they're medical drugs. Nice to you. Um, Antibiotics can be self administered or they can be prescribed. Most of the antibiotics given out in the UK are prescribed. If you go to Brazil, you can buy it over the counter. 
I have a PhD student from Bangladesh who's amazed at how difficult it is to get um, antibiotics here in the UK. He's been here for a year. He said in Bangladesh, you go to the local shop, you buy them, and you can eat them like food. <laughs> it's incredible. And I said, that's going in the first line of your thesis. In addition to use in humans, we've also got veterinary use, okay? We've got use in animals, proper use in animals, when the animals are sick, okay? Again, we want to save the animals. We don't want the national herd to die if they're all ill, so if they need antibiotics, that's great. But they're also used for food production animals. No longer in the EU, are they actually, but in the US, one of the major uses of antibiotics is to give to all of the animals that they've got, which they raise for food. Because there's an almost imperceptible amount of data which shows that the animals get bigger, slightly faster, and therefore can be harvested quicker. So it's an economic reason. Okay? And all this adds to the environmental um, antibiotic load and the exposure to the bacteria, because obviously they're excreted onto the land. In addition, we've got more undefined things like social class, age, lifestyle, geography, and race. So we've got some data here from the Health Protection Agency just showing that cipro resistance in E. coli was higher in Asian populations, com particularly compared to black populations. There's no real understanding of the relationships between this particular data set and the, uh, the humans involved, but it's there, it's unequivocal. And it also exists internationally as well. So this is um, Streptococcus pneumoniae, which is resistant or non-susceptible to erythromycin. And you can see here in the Mediterranean countries, the amount, the percentage of resistance is a lot higher. But it doesn't tally with use. Well, it does in Spain, actually, because they give everything away. It's a bit like Brazil. Uh, but in the more northern countries, there's a lot less. And again, the reasons for that are still ill-defined. In addition, we've got exposure to heavy metals. So if we imagine... Um, amalgam restorations, for example, fillings in your teeth, 50% of those fillings are mercury, and there are also silver and copper, zinc. All of these elements, okay, are antibacterial, and bacteria, um, bacteria evolve to put resistance genes together to minimise the load to themselves. So you might have a mercury resistance gene which has managed to get linked to an antibiotic resistance gene. So if you're selecting for metal resistance, you may inadvertently be selecting for antibiotic resistance as well. And then we've got the transfer of antibiotic resistant bacteria, okay? If emergence of resistance occurred in a hospital and we could keep it there, it probably wouldn't be much of a problem. But unfortunately, we tend to travel a lot, okay? And we've got poor hygiene. We also have companion animals. <coughs> so this just shows, this just shows the metro in Tokyo where they actually employ people to push the people on the train so there's no air available actually you just fill it with humans because it's economically more viable so imagine being on a train like that and then somebody sneezes now each one of these aerosols there's two things about these aerosols you can see one, they're big enough to be photographed and probably only represent 0.1% of the total aerosols produced in a sneeze and two, none of them will be sterile all of them will contain bugs. So the smaller particles that you get, which you can't see, which contain bugs, will travel along the tube train very fast. So it's probably within minutes everybody has breathed in an aerosol from that sneezing man. This just highlights the amount of metal you could have. And then a lot of us have pets, okay? They go to the vets, they're treated with antibiotics. A lot of pets lick people's faces and other things. And you get the sharing of the bacterial flora between them, okay? And then finally, there are also a lot of unknown mechanisms. We really do not understand all of the selection pressures for antibiotic resistance. Uh, so there's still a lot of work to be done. Okay, so how can bacteria become resistant? So I've listed five foreknown and five unknown here. So what we've got, we can have enzymatic detoxification or alteration of the antibiotic. So this is where the bacteria can produce a protein probably encoded by a plasmid, but it may be on the chromosome. And this protein, this enzyme, will alter the antibiotic. It may, in the, for example, beta-lactamases, it may cleave the beta-lactam ring. So it will make the antibiotic ineffective. We can have decreased drug accumulation. So this is where the bacteria produce a protein which lodges in the cell wall, and it acts as a pump, and it pumps out the intracellular antibiotic molecules. 
lowering the intracellular concentration to a point where it's no longer able to kill the cell. And then we've got alteration of the target site. So if you imagine this is a ribosome, this is exactly what they look like, actually. Okay, so if you've got tetracycline, for example, tetracycline will come, bind to the ribosome, prevent protein synthesis, and the cell will die. But if the cell produces tetracycline-resistant protein, which obviously is green and round, that can bind to the ribosome before the tetracycline molecule does, so the tetracycline is ineffective and that bacteria can go on and divide. It's resistant. And then also we've got bypass of the antibiotic sensitive step. So if you've got redundancy built into your metabolic pathways and a particular antibiotic only affects that one step, but you can get from A to C another way, you're resistant. And then there's also mechanisms of resistance which we, again, do not understand. And I keep saying we don't understand it because I don't want you to think when I've gone that actually we know everything. We don't know a lot at all. There's a lot of work to do. So, resistance can be um, compartmentalised into two groups. We've got intrinsic resistance or acquired. So, intrinsic resistance is a naturally occurring trait of the organism. It can be species or genus specific. And what happens is that cells may simply lack the target site of an antibiotic. So, that antibiotic will never work against that cell. It's got nothing to work on. Or, the cell membranes can be impermeable to the antibiotic. So, the antibiotic simply can't get it in. Okay? And this is the case with with vancomycin resistance and E. coli. And this can really delineate the spectrum of activity of a particular antibiotic. Next, we've got acquired resistance. Okay? This can be two types, spontaneous or acquired DNA by horizontal gene transfer. So spontaneous resistance is a mutation in the DNA. Okay? Mutation in any gene occurs one in every 10 million cells. You can imagine if you start from one cell, it can give you 10 to the 9 cells overnight. They divide, some bacteria can divide within 20 minutes. So if there's one mutation which gives rise to resistance to a particular antibiotic, overnight you can have an entire population of 100 million cells, all of which are resistant. And this is sometimes seen during therapy, and then you get um, failure of therapy. What we've also got is acquired antibiotic resistance by horizontal gene transfer. So this cartoon just illustrates what we've got here is a big recipient cell in the middle and then some donor cells here. So when some dead cells die, they burst and they release their DNA. This DNA can then transform a recipient cell. So this cell can take up the free DNA, whether it be a plasmid or the chromosome, and if it contains a resistance gene and it's incorporated into the genome of the recipient, you get transfer of resistance. And then you've got conjugation, which is kind of the direct cell-to-cell -cell contact from the donor cells to the recipient, and they actively transfer their DNA from one cell to another. And if that's, uh, that DNA contains resistance genes, you get the transfer of resistance. And that can be both plasmid or chromosomal as well. And then finally, you've got bacteriophage-mediated DNA transfer. So this is where bacterial viruses, they usually take up their own DNA, and packages it, package within their heads and then infect another bacteria. But they can sometimes take up bacterial DNA as well. And if that DNA contains a resistance gene, they can then transfer it to a different host. So, what can we do about it? Well, it's really easy, isn't it? We can reduce use. And we can reduce use everywhere across the board. Um, one of the main places that we can reduce use is in farming and food, animal food production. And interestingly, a few days ago, McDonald's said that they were no longer going to use chicken that had been reared with antibiotics, which is absolutely excellent. But they've said this kind of thing before, so we'll have to wait and see if they actually do it. But reduction is really the key. However, it's not always the answer, because sometimes when you reduce use, the resistance still stays around. So in Denmark, they used to use avaparsi to breed their pigs, and they stopped using it in the 90s. But even today, you can get vancomycin. Vancomycin and avaparsi are very, very similar. You can get vancomycin resistance genes from the pig farms. Um, and that's because the evolution is really quite stable. Sorry, the resistance is really quite stable. So why is this resistance stable? Well, it's all about evolution. Again, everything is about evolution. Evolution will select for resistance mechanisms which pose the least cost 
or the less burden to the host cell. Okay? And resistance determinants and bacteria can co-evolve to minimise this burden. So to illustrate this burden, I've just put two Santa Clauses here. Okay? I first did this particular slide at Christmas and it seemed quite apt. Less so now. Maybe it should be an Easter bunny. I don't know. <laughs> However, you imagine a race between these two Santas, okay? This Santa hasn't got a very large bag. He hasn't got a large burden. This one has. If they both had to run 100 metres, I think this one would probably win. We've got to assume that everything else is the same, they've got equal running capacity, etc. But this one is carrying a huge burden. He's not going to win the race. He will be selected against. It's the same with bacteria. Okay? If bacteria have resistance genes and it's metabolically costly for them to maintain them, then what will happen is if you re remove the selective pressure, the bacteria will probably re reduce or lose the genes. So evolution selects for the resistance which has no biological cost. So what happens now is that when we remove the sorry, when we remove the drugs, the resistance can stay around because there's no selection against it. And often resistance genes for disused antibiotics are linked to useful resistances. So this is just a list of all the different genes on a particular plasmid from a Lactococcus um, bacteria. And what we've got here, we've got tetracycline resistance, chloramphenicol resistance, streptomycin resistance, and macrolide, so that's erythromycin resistance. So if you treat a human that contains this bacteria with erythromycin, you are inadvertently selecting for strep, chloramphenicol, and tetracycline resistance as well. Now we haven't used streptomycin for 40 years, but we can't get rid of the resistance, because it's always linked to useful resistances. So it poses a bit of a problem. So, going back to the topic, what can we do about it? Are there any alternatives to antibiotics that we could start to look at? Well, there are. What I to say. So one of them is photodynamic therapy. So this is effectively zapping microbes with light, okay? So PDT is where light activates a photosensitizer molecule. And the photosensitizer molecules, when activated, release oxygen species, reactive oxygen. Okay? And this causes DNA damage, um, it disassociates the cell membranes, and it leads to death. And it's really good for biofilm disruption, actually, where sometimes you can't get an antibiotic deep within the bacterial mass. And also, the short lifespan and the multiple targets that cause death means that resistance to PDT is very unlikely to occur. So there's a lot of work going on in this particular topic at the moment as an alternative to antibiotics. There's also probiotics, okay? our alliance with the good bacteria. So this is the use of live organisms to confer a health benefit. And it does actually work in some cases. Okay? They can prevent pathogen colonization by producing bacteriocins. So bacteriocins are small proteins that some bacteria use to kill others, so they get all the food and the space. If you put in beneficial bacteria into a gut, for example, that can outcompete pathogens, it's another way that you can reduce the numbers. And it can also prevent adhesion of pathogenic bacteria to host cells. And it's been shown that lactobacillus and some yeasts can prevent recurrent Clostridium difficile infections. So they are actually being used. And then more horribly, but with greater success, whole fecal transplants are being used. Um, that's exactly what I thought. <laughs> so, so what's happening here is that some people who have Clostridium difficile infections continue to get recurrent Clostridium difficile infections. And it's really debilitating. And some of these patients, they just want to die. They've had enough. So what they will do is entertain having a whole fecal transplant from a, patient, um, from a family member. And they just put it into a food mixer, put it into a tube, stick it up. And the success rate is about 99.9%. It's incredible. So basically what you're doing is just modifying the gut microbiome so you make it too competitive for Clostridium difficile to survive in there. Okay, so it does work. And there's a lot of work going on in microbiome studies. We've also got phage therapy. There's a lot of work being going on in this. I've just submitted a £300,000 grant to the MRC to try and use it for C. diff. Um, and this is basically using bacterial viruses to treat infections of bacteria. Okay? They've been used 
solidly by the Soviet Union um, and there's a massive institute in Georgia which still use them and they produce all these phage cocktails and they do so because antibiotics were too expensive years ago so they had to go down the bacteriophage route and there's various there's, there's a lot of success using these but there's one problem in that <coughs> excuse me bacteriophage and bacteria have a predator prey relationship so resistance to bacteriophage is always occurring but fortunately phage can also evolve to reinfect bacteria that become resistant. So you get this kind of interplay between them. So controlling that and preventing resistance is the major um, problem at the moment with phage therapy. And then there's also a renewed interest in home remedies, things like tea tree oil, honey, silver, not men, silver. <laughs> um, they're all showing a renewed resurgence. If you go to Holland and Barrett now, compared to 10 years ago, there are shells full of these home remedies. But there are, there are truths in these. Tea, for example. So tea, which is a marvellous drink, by the way, enabled the emergence of civilizations in the Eastern world. It was only with the adoption of tea that congregations of humans could survive more than about a thousand individuals. Because without tea, when they drank the water, the water was always contaminated with sewage, and everybody got ill and died. In the Western world, we had weak beer, so there was a small amount of alcohol. So it was only either with the tannins in the tea, which were antimicrobial, or a small amount of alcohol, that cities emerged, actually. So these, these antimicrobials are inherent to our development. Honey, that has also got antimicrobial properties, and there's a lot of research going on into that, and as I've said, silver. Uh, is a well-known antimicrobial. Um, and then we've got other more crackpot ideas. For example, homeopathic medicines. So I think the definition of homeopathic medicines is to fight self with self. So you get some nasty chemical and you dilute it to the point where there's no nasty chemical left and then you take that. And it might make it better. However, it doesn't. Because there's uh, an absolutely conclusive study recently uh, published from a massive effort in Australia which shows that after review of all the literature and thousands and thousands of studies there is no evidence that any homeopathic treatment has a benefit. But the most obvious thing to me that we can do is to get new drugs. Okay? We have an era, the golden era of drug discovery, where we had a little problem with the resistance, because we always have an alternative in the cupboard. Clinicians with a very sick patient or a ward of very sick patients could try many different things. Now that luxury is gone. So if we can find new drugs, that would be really, really cool. There are two types. We can get new bactericins, which are produced by bacteria. These are proteins, they're ribosomally produced. They're very diverse, they're usually very small. Um, they can often be found on operons with 11, up to 11 genes, actually it's up to 11, 35 now, genes required for the production of one particular protein. Um, and these, these have different effects on cells. They can puncture the cell walls to release the contents. They can bind to DNA. There's many different ways that bacteria can compete with other bacteria by producing bactericins. And there's also the production of new... Ooh, that's a terrible slide. <laughs> that didn't work. Anyway, if we imagine this one, and these two aren't here, this, this tetrabactin has been produced. I'm going to move this because I really like the structure. Yeah. How do I get rid of that? <laughs> so it's working on that. Anyway, right, so this is half the structure of a new. Um, molecule, which has recently been found, okay? The other half is kind of underneath this piece of apparatus here. So tazobactin represents the first new class of antibiotic which has been discovered in over 30 years. And what the researchers did was use quite a neat trick to discover it. So in soil, there are many, many, many different bacteria, and we can only grow a very, very small number of them, okay? So we can probably grow 0.1% of the different species of bacteria that we can find in soil. Okay, it's called the Great Plate Count Anomaly. If we look under a microscope at soil, we can see a million cells. But actually, if we try and grow it in the lab, we could probably only grow 10,000. 
So there's a lot of unexplored bacteria in the soil, which we could use to see if they produce new drugs. And that's exactly what these guys did when they found Tazobactin. So it was in one of the researchers' back gardens. And what they did, they isolated individual cells and put them in this well, and then put this well containing the individual cells back in the soil. Okay? So rather than trying to grow them in the lab, they actually grew them in their normal environment. And then they took it out after a week and they were all grown. And they were isolated so they were pure. And then they saw if they produced new drugs. And yes, they did. I think they found 17. This is just one of them. So it looks like there's a, a huge reservoir of new compounds that we can have a look at if we can get the culture conditions right. And then this is where you come in as well. I know it's such a cataclysmic problem and we're all going to die, but we might as well have a bit of fun. <laughs> so I've done this crowdfunding project called Swab and Send, which you may have heard about. And basically what it is, is that if you're involved, you get a swab <coughs> sent to you by the post or brought to you by me. And what we're asking you to do is to think about competitive environments that bacteria live in, such as soils. Okay? It could be dust, it could be something in your fridge which you've forgotten about for a year and there's lots of different colours of mould. That's excellent. That's really what we're looking for. Okay? Somewhere really grotty and dirty <coughs> where the bugs are going to be competing to survive and there's going to be lots of them. And simply what we ask you to do is to swab it, send it back to us and then at UCL what we'll do is plate it out and we get this kind of thing. We get different bugs. This is obviously a nice plate which I've prepared for the photograph. They're usually a bit more messy. But essentially what we'll do is pure culture everything that we can that grows from your swabs. Okay? And then we're going to see if those bacteria produce any antimicrobial substances. <coughs> and we can do this by overlaying this agar plate with some top agar containing our indicator strain. So we put another bacteria into the top agar, and then we let that grow. And if any of these produce anything which can kill it, you get this kind of zone of inhibition. And then we'll take that further forward and see what kind of antibiotic it's producing. So in order to do this, last week, me and Liam, the PhD student who was involved, we swabbed a sink in my lab, and we got all of these. And then we thought we'd go through the entire experiment. And to our surprise, we did get one. So you can see this bacterial colony here growing, and this kind of cloudiness all over the plate is the indicator bacteria. But we've actually got a zone of inhibition around this. So there's something in the sink in my lab which is managing to kill our indicator strain. So it seems like it's that easy. But I didn't want to say that. I was going to say if we want to use it to illustrate how difficult it is to find an antibiotic. But the thing is, we probably know this one already. Okay? So the pharmaceutical companies dropped out of sampling soils because they kept finding the same thing. They kept finding vancomycin, they kept finding streptomycin, and daptomycin actually. But now we have new ways to grow, or we have new things that we haven't yet sampled, such as the insides of your fridge or the bottom of your shoes, we might get some weird and wonderful bugs producing some really novel things. And that may give us the opportunity to take our research forward and find some new compounds which can help. Okay, and I'll finish there and happily take any questions. <laughs>